This is a volcano axe that I modeled almost from scratch. While I didn't come up with the design and I did follow a course, I did do all of the steps to create said axe and I learned a lot of things along the way and I wanna share some of those things with you because I believe that a lot of motion designers and VFX artists skip some of the artistic stuff and it leads to worse results. And I learned that I don't wanna skip steps to get worse results, I want the best stuff. So let's talk about the things that you can do to get the best stuff. Let's go. Before we go any further, I do want to shout out Abe Leo or www.ableo3d.com for his course. I am not sponsored by him at all, but I learned so many things along the way. Perhaps the most important thing that I learned is to do actually good work. You have to sit down for a long time and do the work. I think the course is about like five hours and I probably spent about five times as long creating this asset. Granted, I don't have a modeling background, so that will hopefully get faster. But the number one lesson that any VFX 3D artist, motion graphics artist I know could learn is just creating good work. It takes time. Sit down and do it. It'll be worth it. I promise. The second main thing that I learned throughout this process is understanding shape, detail, and topology. So from a distance... This axe looks pretty similar to the concept that we had here. Okay, cool. Obviously, we are working with a much more low poly version, but this stage is super important because if your asset does not invoke the same style from a distance, it doesn't really matter because you're off concept completely. So when it comes to getting the shape, reference is super important and I wish I learned more of that more but that's something that you just get into the habit of when you're in art school and I didn't go to art school so I'm learning that you need to get good reference and you need to make sure that your concept matches the reference that you're trying to do. Now as far as detailing stuff that's where topology comes in. Now after you establish your reference and you're in the process of creating something the number one thing I always want to do is I want to skip steps I want to jump to the very end stage where I have an asset that I'm ready for animation or I can do my short film or whatever project I'm trying to do and I have learned throughout this entire project that after you have the shape, understanding detail and how you're going to get that detail into the final product is very important. And that comes down to baking. Well, if you don't know what baking is, it basically means you're taking all the details of a super high poly model and projecting it onto the lower poly version. Now, we can see here in the center, we have the super low poly version. And if I hit the tab key, we can see that there is not a lot of geometry inside this model right here. Let's go ahead and hit Z6 right here and we can see that we have a very different look across all of the topology of these models. This one on the left is the final version versus this one on the right. If I hit tab, we're going to see a very dense mesh of so many polygons, especially around the organic detailed shapes such as the rocks here. This is important though because this process does require you to make a low poly version for the shape, as I mentioned earlier. Then you need to dive into the detailing, creating that thing that speaks to the artistic vision. What is the look going to evoke? What is the style going to inspire? And then you have to think about the technical stuff. And the problem with most modern mindsets is they wanna skip steps so then they can get to the end product of making something super good. but if you don't start with the reference and the design stage, and then you don't think about the intentional design and details, and then you think about the technical stuff, if you try and skip any of those things, you're going to get worse results. If I hit Z8 on my keyboard and go back to my cycles preview here, we can see here that obviously this one in the center has no detail at all. But when we create that detail in sculpt and then take that information in the high detail, we can get a low poly version that's so much more manageable to work with. Now, if I turn on my statistics here in the top left-hand corner of my cycles preview, if I click on this center model, the total bulk of this geometry is only 1,600 triangles versus the entire scene has about 3.3 million. Now, if I click on this one on the right, we can see that it has about 3.3 million triangles. And this one on the very far left has about 30,000. Now, I will admit, this is probably pretty high, and Abe will probably roast me for creating a 30,000 triangle axe like so, 
But what I will say is I'm pretty stoked with this and constantly in the process of creating 3D models and work for my other clients, I have found that the biggest bottleneck is not how many polygons, obviously don't go crazy as in the right, but it's textures and texture density. So with that, that brings us to the second reason why we should think about our models. So in my journey of creating this axe, I discovered that the importance of projecting details in the bake from a high poly model is super important, but where that detail really shines is in the texturing as well. And one of the biggest issues I found between a lot of modern motion designers especially is that we want to avoid uvs like the plague now if you're scratching your head what are uvs well let's jump over to the uv edit tab we can take a look at what we are experiencing when we talk about uvs this is the uv map layout of my geometry and i will say it's not perfect i did some cheaty hacky things to try and get a uv unwrap on my model and what I mean by cheaty hacky things is I can go into a piece of geometry. Let's just hit tab right here, hit tab on this model right here, and just hit A. And if we zoom in to our UV map, we can see that there's a bunch of polygons here. Now, the problem with this is that all these polygons are overlapping. So the first thing that we need to understand when it comes to creating really high quality 3D assets is you cannot, under any circumstance, have any polygons overlapping in your UV. I'm sure there are certain circumstances that are out of my scope where you could have overlapping polygons, such as polygon selections and different material maps, but in general, not a good idea to have polygons overlapping. So the cheaty hacky thing that I did on some of the pieces on the left is if you select everything, go up to UV and Smart UV Project, it will basically do its best job to take all the details here and give it an even distribution. Now, that's not bad for super simple things. And in some projects that I do, this is what I do because you don't need to have perfect UVs every single time. But if you're creating a super epic hero asset, such as an ax like this, where a main character is running around wreaking havoc on a battlefield, slaying some monsters and fighting dragons and whatnot with this crazy ax, you wanna make sure that that asset has enough fidelity and the textures to warrant how epic it is. So if I zoom back out here, we can see that a large portion of this axe right here is a large portion of my UV tile. And if I select everything here, nothing is overlapping. Now you might be wondering, can't you create some cool shaders and surface imperfections using 3D software, such as adding grunge and dirt? Yes, you can. But I swear to God, if I ever have to do that again in my life for anything that's not super technical, like an animated texture in Unreal Engine, it's never gonna be worth the time. The reason why is when you open up something like Substance Painter, you can get much faster results without spending a lot of mental brain power and effort. Let me show you. The first thing you need to understand about creating a high poly and low poly model is if we look at the folder structure I have, I have a lot of different versions of this ax plus the substance files. But if I take this low poly version right here, drop it into Substance Painter and go ahead and use the default settings. Using the default straight out of the box with Substance Painter, we get this and sure, it evokes the shape and the, the color of shadow in certain spots. Obviously there's no colors on it right now, but if I go ahead and hit the croissant button right up here. Go ahead and select my high poly version of the ax that I am working on, like so. And I'm just gonna use the default settings as is, and I hit the bake button. Something magical is gonna happen. All that super high detail is coming onto this model based on the high poly version. If I go ahead and leave this, we can see now that there is so much more detail in the model. And the reason why this is happening is it's taking all the data of where the polygons are facing on the high end and then projecting it onto the textures of the low end so we can get this nice little detail around this rock area. Obviously, and one thing that's very important, this looks crunchy if you are this close to your model. So considering how close you're gonna be to your asset is also super important. But if you're only gonna be this far away, most of the time, you don't need to go crazy. If you're doing a close-up shot like that, you might have to do a completely separate model where you're doing the exact rock texture or blade scratches where that's actually in the geometry. But 
What I mean to say is if you have good textures and good understandings of UVs and how to apply them to a model, you'll get much better results. Let's go ahead and open up the other version, the final version of these textures. And you can take a look at how I built some of this. So if you look at the final textures that I created for this, this looks pretty epic. And the reason why I am never ever gonna try doing crazy node graphs in Cinema 4D or Blender because I can use substance is because of this very reason, smart materials right here. If I go ahead and just find something such as metal and just drop in this iron forged old like so on the very top, everything is going to be iron. Obviously, we're not getting some emissive on some of these materials, specifically this top one that we added, but now everything is iron. Cool. But what makes this even better is if we right click on this and go ahead and add a black mask to it. Now that material is not going to show at all, but I can go into the black mask, right click, go to generator and add a generator such as a metal edgeware. And now only on the edges of the normals of the geometry, which is really complex to say, the edges, the sharp parts, we're getting this material right here, which looks pretty epic. And if you were to create this in Cinema 4D or Blender or Maya or V-Ray, or whatever you're using, whatever 3D software, it would take a ton of node graphs, a ton of different masks and things, when you can just be an artist and paint and spend $30 for an hour of your time to get something that looks pretty good, or you can handcraft it after about three hours and get something pretty epic. So moving forward, at least for my work, what I'm saying is that if I ever have to have something in my scene, I want to make sure that it has custom textures or it's really far from camera so that we don't even need to see the fine details. And if it still is not matching with the scene because the textures are wrong, maybe that asset doesn't belong in the scene at all. And what I hope my friends watching this video will take away is if you spend time doing decent UVs, at least half decent, you can get much better results with your textures rather than trying to rely on super cheaty hacky things in other 3D software to try and get some fancy texture effects. Do the work, it'll be worth it, I promise. Now one of the things that I struggled with most as someone who's been spending most of their time behind a camera for my artistic career is that I just want instant gratification. And sometimes I just wanna think of things as a whole, like the model was get up in their full cosplay or the board game is already set up. Rather, it's more important to think about the individual pieces of whatever artwork you're trying to make. The third thing that I really needed to get hammered into my head during this process is that there is a process and each process, the bigger it is, the harder it's going to be to wrap your head around. So this applies to this game axe in a couple of ways. First off, individual components. These little bolts should be a single piece by themselves. Sure, I did mesh this geometry together, so it's a little bit easier to work with, but this little bolt right here is just a hexagon extruded with some bevels. Awesome. I will say I did use the ZBrush bolts pack for that, but it's a bolt by itself. I didn't try and do any crazy extrusions from this metal piece. Oftentimes, it's better to think about how something would be made in real life and emulating that rather than trying to keep it all together at once. The second thing that is also worth mentioning is that while this axe is broken down into multiple components, it's also important to remember that each phase of the process for creating the artwork also deserves its own time and attention. And I have found that, at least for me, at my current stage in my artistic career, it is not worth spending the time trying to blend the technical and the artistic tasks and skill sets. So what I mean to say is that this high poly version of this volcano here is its own step. And I am not trying to worry about topology of this model because if I worry about topology of this while also trying to be a designer and design something that looks cool, I'm gonna get worse results on both of those tasks rather than just deliberately focusing on one task at a time. So what I'm trying to say is focus on the individual steps and for your artwork, focus on the individual components relative to how important it is to the design. These little bolts, not a lot of detail, hence not a lot of polygons, but this volcano, if I go ahead and select it, 500,000 triangles, a lot of stuff here. So small steps, very important. 
The fourth thing I learned throughout this process is that you need to be okay redoing work. And that is not something a lot of motion designers want to hear, especially as someone who has shot a lot of camera stuff, you don't really get reshoots. So it's just this mindset that you need to break when you're actually trying to make an artwork. If you want it to be the best, sometimes you just have to go ahead and redo it. Now, what I mean to say by that is if we look at these axes, I have a couple versions and there's obviously some differences between them and the textures. But what I want to really call out is this one on the right versus this one in the center. And the one on the left also applies as well. But if we zoom in a little bit more, while we can't get super close because it's not that much of a hero asset, we can see that, yeah, there's a little bit of halation glow happening around these pieces right here. If you're this far, it's not that bad. And we can kind of omit that for some things, but if you look at this version right here, there is something weird happening, especially as you get super close and personal with the rocks in this spot. Why is that? I'm gonna confess, I don't really know. But what I will say is that this version is a version where I tried to do some cheaty hacky things. If I go ahead and hit Z6 on my keyboard, we can see the geometry as is. And this volcano right here is one mesh, or rather, let's go ahead and select this and see, this is all one separate piece and this blade is all one separate piece. But if we go into this model right here and we go ahead and hit L on the keyboard or tab and then we select this polygon, hit L to select all the connected polygons, we can see that this blade and the volcano are all one piece. Now, if I had to guess, it's because in the baking process where we created the actual extra detail on it because we had extra polygons on the inside of this axe while they weren't showing, it created some weird artifacts in the second version. Now, again, if your silhouette is super fine and you're not gonna be up that close, maybe having overlapping polygons in that capacity is fine, but this version on the right, if I hit Z8 once again, pull up my cycles, we can see here that even from this distance, there's something weird and funky happening. Now what about the one on the left? It's kind of the same detail, and what I did to try and fix it was added a little bit more geometry around the blade, but for some reason, this one actually ended up being worse. So, what did I do? Going back to what I was saying earlier with this tip, I bit the bullet, I redid the work, I did all of this topology of this piece by hand, manually and sometimes you just got to go in and do the work but when you do it's worth it in summary this entire project taught me a lot and perhaps the most important thing is that there are a series of steps and phases that are worth acknowledging every single time and only focusing on those individual steps the first is the block in getting the base shape getting it to look half decent that's why the first version of this axe looked like this. It wasn't pretty and it looked kind of gross, but it got the point across, and especially from a distance, sure. We're matching the concept and the reference and that's the first step. The second is the details. And that is done in sculpt, that's done in sometimes textures, but really getting it to evoke the correct emotion that you wanted. This was the final zebra sculpt that I ended up putting together and it is about 11.1 million points on this object. It's a lot of detail here, but this is not the final asset. And that's not a big thing that a lot of motion designers skip. They're just like, all right, looks pretty. Let's go to the next step. When in reality, there's a whole technical process that needs to be acknowledged. That technical process is the word that everyone hates, but it's retopology. Doing it by hand will get you the best results. Sure, you can get some pretty decent results if you do it automatically with certain tools, but I have found through my experience in this project, if you do it by hand, if we go back over to Blender and pull up said file, we can see that the final version of this ax is gonna look pretty dang sweet. And that's because we did the manual retopology. But the manual retopology doesn't just stop there. You have to spend time doing at least half decent UVs. Let's go ahead and select everything. Go to the UV edit tab. You can't get everything in just retopology. You have to have at least decent UVs. And this is something that I think a lot of motion designers should just start thinking about more. UVs will get you better looking 
assets which will help your work in the long run. Now, topology doesn't just stop there. You obviously need to have decent topology, so then you could UV unwrap it. And I know UV is a dirty word among all of my motion designer friends, but it's important. It's important because it will allow you to get the amazing texture detail that you might see in something like Substance Painter. When we click over to the painted version, it looks awesome. And while it does sound like a lot of steps of work, if you do the steps, you will actually save time if you do the work rather than trying to build some procedural crazy thing down the line that might save you some time just in case. Just do the work. And what I mean to say behind making this entire video is that when you sit down, actually do the work, you're gonna get better results rather than trying to cheat it and hack it later on. Now, I hope this video doesn't come off as a little harsh. I learned a lot of things and it's mainly for me to hear because there are sometimes I just wanna take the path of least resistance, but Sometimes when you put yourself in uncomfortable situations and you push through that, it makes you better. And uh, I think that's just a thing that is universal between training and exercise, which is something I enjoy doing, and art. And this project was certainly outside of my comfort zone, but I am now confident and comfortable saying I have a, a stronger understanding of ZBrush and Blender. While I am mainly a Cinema 4D user, that was where the course was, and I just did the course as is and I feel much stronger as an artist after the fact because I allowed myself to learn and be a student in this project. So I think that's important to always consider. Anyways, that's it. I hope you enjoyed this breakdown, behind the scenes, just vlog experience of me talking about how I made this asset, this ax, this course thing. I hope you enjoyed. If you have questions, comments, concerns about any of this, I would love to help out. If you have specific questions on anything that I've done, I would be happy to help you out. And uh, I do recommend checking out Abe's course. He makes good content. I've learned a lot from him. And uh, I'm typically not one to... Uh, uh, plug things unless I truly believe in them and boy I learned a lot so that's it hope you enjoyed until next time each protein the one gram per pound of body weight will help you make some gains goodbye goodbye my friends bye <laughs>